welcome everyone to our April virtual presentation. Let's begin the program by asking Khan to introduce our speaker. Tonight's presentation on Franklin's building stones by Antimon will be like a geology field trip in which the rocks will come to us instead of us visiting the rock outcrops across New Brunswick and the country. Uh, I have known Anne since she came to UNB in 2014. Uh, she's a senior instructor and curator in earth sciences, develops and maintains exhibitions for Quartermain Earth Science Center, Science East, and traveling exhibits. Um, growing up, Anne loved fossils and volcanoes, and in her uh, bio on the UNB website, it says uh, museums were her second home. Anne obtained her Bachelor's of Science in Earth Sciences from Waterloo in 95, after which she went globe trotting for a while and she worked for Geophysical Company uh, throughout North America and Africa. She went back to school and obtained her Master's and PhD in Geology from Carleton University in Ottawa and got totally involved in outreach and teaching geoscience. Anne's teaching load reflects her love of initiating awe and wonder in our planet and its people. Uh, Anne and I both love the, uh, using the outdoor classrooms like parks and trails, and yes, buildings to teach about rocks and the planet's Earth, planet Earth's history. Uh, downtown Ferriton is one of those outdoor classrooms where the rocks have come to us. Much of what we know about New Brunswick stone buildings comes from Gwen Martin's For the Love of Stone volumes. Anne is very keen to share this love with anyone who is interested. So enjoy our walk. And Anne, over to you. So again, my name is Anne Timmermans. And yes, I work at, uh, as curator and an associate teaching professor at the Quartermainer Science Center. And uh, that's situated at the University of New Brunswick. So I'm thrilled to have this opportunity to talk about one of my many passions, and that is sharing earth science literacy, which means understanding how earth has influenced us as humans. And now, especially these days, how us humans are influencing the earth. So I've learned as a geologist that every rock has a story. And here in New Brunswick, we have a billion years worth of stories. And in our most recent chapter, geologically speaking, humans have been part of that story. So this tour has two purposes. I would like to introduce you to different rock types. So we're going to be looking at a rock called granite and sandstone, and if there's time, limestone. That can be seen in a leisurely virtual stroll through our historic downtown Fredericton. And as Tone said, instead of traveling outside the urban area into where the outcrops are and seeing the rocks in situ, meaning in the outcrop, we get to experience geology right here uh, in the downtown Fredericton area where stonemasons and designers and builders have taken the time to bring the stones to us. Second, I would like to demonstrate the range of beauty of the building stones that we have in the architecture in the buildings in, in Fredericton. Now I am not an, arche um, an archeologist or I'm not, uh, sorry, um, all the, the, the information I know about the architecture and the people behind them, I have learned through Gwen Martin, through our archives and through good old Google. But uh, the geology part, I will be able to dabble into a little bit more. But they are very beautiful and there's lots of stories to tell and very interesting stories of the people inside these buildings. So let's get going with our tour. See if this works. All right, so we have a beautiful view of downtown Fredericton. We're going to go back in time and uh, Tone has already mentioned Gwen Martin, a shout out to Gwen who is, uh, has done the lion's share of research for the, this building stone tour. So in her younger years, this is Gwen in her younger years, was a freelance geologist, a prospector, and a geotourism guide. She jumped 
freight trains and played lounge piano. And this is a photo of Gwen. She has just bought her first car. And after a very difficult night in the pub, <laughs> you can see that from her eye patch, uh, she posed for a picture. So she's done a lot of work through uh, the government of New Brunswick for the Department of Energy, Mines and, and Mineral Development. Um, she has done a lot of writing for them and she's also an author for several books. One is Gesner's Dream and I'll mention um, Gesner in my talk today. And For the Love of Stone. Uh, she has a passion for outreach and education. She's passionate about learning through storytelling. And so she has been involved with the education, uh, New Brunswick education community um, and has done many hands-on outreach activities through middle school and high school and elementary school uh, kids. And she's still writing. Here we go. Um, she is now at home writing a mystery book about a forensic geologist. So forensic geology is a thing. And so I can't wait to read it. Uh, so this is a forensic geologist living in fictional village of Curlew Bay and is the Atlantic representative for a crime writers of Canada. So I can't wait to see that when it's out. So that's a, hot, that's a shout out to Gwen and also back to you, Tone, because Tone has been a huge influence on me when I arrived to New Brunswick. Uh, he was born in Holland, but he came to work in, uh, in New Brunswick and is again very passionate about education and outreach in the earth sciences. And so here's a picture of Tone actually in the Building Stone tour. And I watched him do the tour. This is him in Science East. Uh, he's, this is Tone actually doing a geo tour at Odell Park. Lots of stories to tell there and has been involved with teachers workshops and so, Tone, I'm sure that you'll be um, collecting some, some stories and some anecdotes for the end of this uh, presentation so you can uh, share some, um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that you'll have some extra stories to, to, to highlight. I also want to say that this is, initiative is contributing to uh, a new paradigm in our geologic heritage. So geoheritage started becoming popular in the 1990s and then had been growing ever since. So not only are we celebrating geo heritage, but now this has expanded to something called geodiversity, which is really thinking about the planet, all the parts of the planet, including the soil and the mountains and the waterways and bringing it all as one big system. And this can contribute to our, our efforts in geoeducation. So institutions like the Quartermainer Science Center, the Fredericton Region Museum, really promoting geoeducation, geotourism, and it, it builds to, to geoconservation where we can actually look to uh, move towards sustainability and the health of our planet. So we have uh, international institutions like UNESCO that recognized one of the first UNESCO global geopark in, was right here in New Brunswick, it was the first in North America, it's called Stonehammer Geopark. And uh, other institutions like the government of New Brunswick and the government of Canada to put in policies in order to help preserve our geo heritage and to uh, again move towards a healthy, sustainable planet. All right, so what I want to do is I want to introduce you to some of the rocks that we're going to be observing during our tour. And so I'm going to bring you back to school, maybe grade seven or grade 10 or even grade four when you learned about the rock cycle. So the rock cycle, we live on a dynamic planet and the rock cycle kicked in early on after Earth's formation. And the rock cycle is composed of, if you can remember, shout it out, three rock groups. There's the igneous rocks, those are the fire rocks. We have sedimentary rocks. Those are the rocks that settle out and metamorphic rocks, the rocks of heat and pressure. Um, we also have magma, melted rock, and then sediments that make up the sedimentary rocks. So these are the components and the arrows that are moving to, between these components represent the processes that change one rock type to another. So this is a simplified rock cycle. You might have seen this type of rock cycle before. It's going around and around and around. It never stops. Um, but really, this is more realistic of what our rock cycle looks like. And I don't want you to become overwhelmed with a diagram like this. But what's really interesting about rocks is that if you learn how to read rocks, 
they represent a very specific environment and a very specific time in which they formed. And so by learning how to read rocks, we can associate their, their paleo environment, their paleo history, and yet how it contributes to our geologic history. So the takeaway from a, a diagram like this, oops, sorry. So the rock cycle, uh, is unique to Earth. We don't have any other planet that we know of that has a rock cycle like we do here on Earth. So it began soon after Earth's for, uh, formation with the start, mainly with the start of plate tectonics. And it's driven by mainly by Earth's internal heat engine and the sun. And it's responsible for our atmosphere. We have it because of the rock cycle, our hydrosphere, and all of us, life on Earth is thanks to the rock cycle. Uh, plays a critical role in keeping Earth's long-term climate stable and it's important to geologists as every rock reveals the particular time and place in which it was formed. So we're going to talk about granite. You know granite is an, is an igneous rock. An igneous rock stands for well it's otherwise known as fire rock. So these are the rocks that are melt, they're super hot and then they cool and crystallize to make igneous rocks. So here's a question, how do you melt a rock? So one of the questions I, I would ask is what with the, the layers of the earth, so here we have a diagram that's showing the layers of the earth and the lithosphere, this is the hard part. It's hard, it's frozen, it's solid and it's brittle. It likes to break if you apply stress. So that's the, the part that we live on. And then this layer underneath is a sort of plasticky ductile um, upper part of the mantle called the asthenosphere. Now, diagrams like this might make you think that the asthenosphere is liquid rock, but it's not. It's actually a solid, kind of like plasticine. So plasticine is a solid, but it likes to bend. And so the asthenosphere is this plasticky layer on which the lithosphere can kind of move about. So that being said, how do you melt rocks? So there's three different environments that can generate enough heat to melt a rock. So one is called decompression melting. So this is when we have an upwelling of heat from the mantle. It, uh, the pressure is lowered as it uh, comes up towards the surface and that will generate melting. So we have actually most of our volcanic, our volcanoes in the ocean, thanks to these, these so oceanic spreading, spreading ridges. So this is one way we can melt rock and generate new, new rock in these spreading ridges. Another way we can melt rock is through hot spots. So interestingly enough, sometimes we have this surge of heat that starts from the core mantle boundary, that very hot core mantle boundary, and then it makes its way up through buoyancy and taking all that heat up with it. And then it hits the lithosphere and causes all sorts of melting. And so a great example of a hot spot is Hawaii. So we have a whole series of volcanic islands thanks to it being situated on a hot spot. And we have lots of really interesting volcanic activity there. The third way is through something called flux melting. So just like when you throw salt onto the snow, it will change its melting temperature. If we add water to rock, it can actually change its melting temperature. So here what we, we call a subduction zone where one of, the, one of these tectonic plates is subducting underneath an overlying plate that when it hits the heat, it's bringing in all that water from the ocean and that water is going to start to percolate up into the overlying plate and we get melting. And this is the environment in which we get all those really nasty volcanoes. Something like um, western coast of South America, we have the Andes mount the volcanic chain. So all of this melt starts to make its way up into the crust. Most of it actually solidifies, cools and crystallizes in the crust. And this is where we get rocks like granite. So if you see a granite, this is where it's being made underneath in the crust after all this melting and maybe somewhere in the area there'd be some volcanic material too. 
So these are the environments that generate volcanic rock or igneous rock that we can see. And it comes to this, and when it does eventually come to the surface, even the rocks that uh, solidify subsurface eventually will be uplifted and, and then we can see it on the surface. It comes and, um, and it generates all of these beautiful rocks with all sorts of different textures that really reveal its history to us. Was it formed underneath the surface? Was it formed on the surface? Was it explosive? Was it non-explosive? So all of this information is captured in the rocks. So the rocks that we're going to see today is an igneous rock called granite. And granite has these really large crystals. It forms subsurface, it cools down slowly, slowly enough for the crystals to grow large and they grow into each other. And we have a name for this texture, it's called interlocking mineral texture. So these really lock in. There's just kind of like, and I got this idea from Tone, it's really kind of like assembling Legos and locking them together. There's really no space in between these individual Lego pieces. And you can kind of think of them as individual minerals. So quartz, we'll be seeing, um, sorry, granite uh, in, our, in our tour today. So another rock group that I'd like to introduce you to is sedimentary rocks. So these are rocks that are the product of the disintegration and the decomposition of, of rocks. Now, you look at a rock outside, you really don't think that they're going to go anywhere, right? But over geologic time, which really is all the time that we can, that, that we need, the rocks will start to break up through something called mechanical weathering. So this is mechanical weathering due to frost wedging where water gets into the cracks and it freezes and expands and it breaks it up. We're in spring now. So when you drive around and see the potholes, that's a really good example of frost wedging in action. And rocks also decompose through chemical weathering. So these are chemical reactions going on on the surface of every rock and either it's being, minerals are being oxidized or they're dissolving, um, they're changing and they're going into a solution. And so they're breaking down, they're decomposing. So this is a picture of my, my, my kid. We're out camping and we're hiking around. And here is a tree. This is an example of, of, of plant wedging that a seed, a little seed fell into the rock and started to grow and it's breaking up a rock. So if you ever wondered why paper beats rock, if you're playing rock, paper, scissors, this is why. The tree is breaking up the rock, not a problem. So eventually all of that material, the solid bits that break down and the, the, the other, the components that go into solution due to chemical weathering, they start moving around. This is a process called erosion and they settle or they precipitate out or they settle out in very specific environments. So if we can recognize the rock type, then we can connect that to the paleo environment, which is really powerful. So how do we know what we know about what the world was like a long time ago? This is one of the reasons how we know is because we can recognize the environment in which these rocks were formed. So we're gonna be looking at sandstone. So we can think about, well, where do we see sand? Well, we see sand on the beach. We can see sand along rivers. So somewhere where there's enough energy that will allow the sand to settle out, but will remove everything else, all right? So sedimentary rocks, this is a nice sandstone and it's made of sand. So if you've, it's just the same sand that you see on the beach or on the river's edge, even on the, off the coast of the St. John River and sedimentary, sedir means to sink down. And really these uh, sand grains, they've been broken up, they've been traveling around, beat up a little bit. So they get rounded out. This is a, a picture of a thin section. So this is one of the ways that we can really look at rocks. We take a slice of rock, about 30 microns thin, place it on a slide and look at, look at it through a microscope. And we can see the individual grains or the individual minerals and get all sorts of information that way. So we can see that these grains are really round. They're not really interlocking like the granite. So this is why sandstone is quite porous. This is an, a scanning electron microscope image of sandstone. And so you can see these sand grains are really just 
jumbled up together. So going back to our Lego analogy, it really does look like somebody just took it all apart and threw it into a pile. And between those mineral grains or those rock fragments, there's little pore spaces, there's little voids. And this is where water can get into or any kind of liquid. And so a lot of our, our groundwater is actually hosted in a rock like sandstone. All right, so the third rock type I wanted just to briefly mention, if we have time to talk about it during the, the, the tour, that was great, but you'll have the heads up, is a rock called limestone. And this is a non-clastic or chemical uh, group of sedimentary rocks. And all of that, um, those the components that are dissolving into our hydrosphere, into the river systems, into the water and moving around, eventually they're gonna to wanna to precipitate out. And some of those components are carbonate components. So they make up a calcium or a calcium magnesium carbonate mineral called calcite and dolomite. And they like to precipitate out in a very specific environment. So if you wanna precipitate out carbonate material, you'll need to either change the temperature to something that's beautiful and warm, or get some critters to do it. So you can have bio, biological processes that pull out carbonate material. So if you think about the, a warm environment like the Bahamas, the Florida Keys, somewhere where you would love to be in the winter time, that would be the environment in which carbonate is being pulled out. Or you can think about a beautiful coral reef and going snorkeling or scuba diving around the coral reef. So all these little critters, are pulling out carbonates and building their hard parts. So eventually when they die, they accumulate and they'll make a, a rock called limestone. And this is where sometimes you find really neat fossils in the rock called limestone. All right, last bit of geology before we get onto our tour. I'm gonna to talk about time, geologic time, otherwise known as deep time. So this is a geologic, one of my favorite geologic time scales because it kind of gives you a sense of what animals and plants were in the area during these individual time periods. So the oldest units are on the bottom and we've been sort of building up our geologic story ever since. And so we can actually divide geologic time based on significant geologic events relatively. So we give these time periods names. So we have these mega time periods called the Paleozoic, Mesozoic and Cenozoic era. Uh, Paleozoic, otherwise known as the age of the arthropod or age of insects. The Mesozoic is the age of the dinosaurs and the Cenozoic is the age of the mammals. And then subdividing from there, we have periods. And we're gonna be focusing on mainly two main periods. One is called the Devonian period, which started 460 million years ago. And the other one is the Carboniferous period which can be divided into two parts, the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian. And that's in between 359 and about 300 million years ago. All right. So now you have all the background you need. So let's get going. So I thought I would just spend a moment to try this. Can everybody see that? Okay. No, probably not. My experiment failed. Can you see the earth? Yeah, okay, so let's go. I like Google Earth. I use Google Earth Explore all the time. So we are gonna go down to Fredericton and we're gonna start in the downtown area. So this is the Fredericton Region Museum. And what we're going to do is we're gonna uh, kind of do a little bit of a loop. So the Fredericton Region Museum, uh, otherwise known as Officer Square, is located right here. We're going to start actually at Science East, which is the old York County Jail, which I don't have my arrow there, but it's uh, in right here. Uh, we're going to look at the, the Officer Square building and then the Provincial building and the Legislative building. Uh, and then if we have time, we'll stop by the federal building. All right. So let's go to the old York County Jail, which uh, it's located at 668 Brunswick Street here in Fredericton, uh, New Brunswick. 
So this was back in the, uh, the day when Fredericton was a new city and it was getting larger. They needed somewhere to put the bad guys. So they needed a jailhouse. So the Fredericton jailhouse um, was, it was, there was a tender that went out for the jailhouse um, September 1839. And they wanted it completed by 1841. Um, but of course it took longer than anticipated. And so it was finished in 1842 and opened in 1843. And it was built by Andrew Blair and designed by John Elliot uh, Wolford. And I'm gonna talk about him in a little bit. He's actually done some really neat architecture in the Fredericton area. So it was opened in 1843 and acted as a jailhouse until 1996, um, and it's still around today. So after um, it opened, uh, well, I can throw it, it actually housed some very interesting criminals. And I'm just gonna highlight a few that uh, you might've heard of. So this is a gentleman, uh, his name is uh, Henry Moore Smith. So this is in the late 1800s, he was a prisoner there and he was a confidence trickster and he was a thief. And, uh, and so he was jailed and he kept escaping. So they, he's actually, this picture is showing him in chains um, waiting to go into the gallows. So uh, he eventually, was sentenced to death, um, but then managed to somehow talk his way out of it and was pardoned. And so he actually left New Brunswick and he left his legacy behind because now his nickname, the Lunar Rogue, um, is presented as a pub, actually just a street over from the jailhouse. So the Lunar Rogue pub is um, named in his honor uh, of Henry Moore Smith or the Lunar Rogue. Another famous, uh, well, this is actually a duel as the Hamilton brothers, and they were possibly the most infinite, infamous in the case of Fredericton's history. Uh, they were jailed due to, a, a, they murdered a taxi driver, but their claim to fame is that they were the last prisoners to be hanged. It was a dual hanging, and this was in the 1940s. And another famous, oh, and I should mention Arthur Ellis. He was the official, Canada's official hangman. And he actually worked at the jailhouse for most of its operation. Another famous um, individual, this actually might be a memory for people that are from here, is Alan Legere, who is the monster of Miramichi. And he was pretty nasty. He liked to kidnap and torture his victims before he killed them. And uh, he was, um, he faked an injury while he was in jail and escaped from the hospital. And then he was caught again and then he was housed in the York County jailhouse uh, during his trial. And his claim to fame is that he was the first Canadian, or the first one of the, one of the first uh, Canadian cases where DNA fingerprints was used in in his um, leading to his guilty charge. So he's actually still around. He's not jailed here in New Brunswick. He's moved somewhere else. But uh, but a lot these stories like this and other stories are actually in Science East, uh, in the bot in the basement of Science East. Uh, kids didn't get away with not being jailed, so young offenders were also jailed in the in Science East or in sorry in the jail, not Science East in the jailhouse. So um, this boy here, he was 11 years old and he was caught stealing, uh, and was warned not to do it again, but he did it again, and so he actually spent uh, 70 days in the in the in the jailhouse, and the youngest prisoner they had was seven years old and he was jailed for a month. It was a team of three that did some thievery and some were jailed for many months and he was jailed for a month. So lots of really neat stories. But in 1996, oops, it was actually bought out by, um, well, the, the science east, um, the jailhouse was turned into a science center. So it is now known as the science east, um, so I should put that, no. Um, it's known as the Science East Science Center, and they still have the cells, they still have the bars on the cells, 
Um, they still have the backyard where they had the, the noose and the, where they did all their, 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 their jailing, but um, they converted the backyard into a playground. They have really neat hands-on science activities in the hallways and the corridors of the, of the science center. So I encourage everybody to go see. And then they have all the stories of the prisoners in the basement. So when they were building the, the jailhouse, they needed stones. And so this building stones, these beautiful building stones, they used a stone called Hampstead granite. And Hampstead granite was sourced from uh, a place called Spoon Island Quarry near Hampstead. Not working. Sorry, I think froze. Okay, here we go. So Hampstead granite is Devonian in the age. So what was going on in, during the Devonian age? So just to give you a perspective of where the continents were in and around, here we are, the Devonian in and around 400 million years ago. So this is the continent called Laurentia and this is a continent called Gondwana. And New Brunswick wasn't even a province yet. We were actually kind of a, a bit of ocean. There's, that's where Frederick would be. We were a bit of ocean and these terrains were moving in and colliding with Laurentia and building up the Eastern coast of what we now know as Atlantic Canada. So a lot of sub, um, subduction zones and terrain smashing into the continent. And uh, so a lot of really neat tectonic activity at that time. So I wanted to show you this geology map just to kind of get your head around um, this geology, a bedrock geology map of, of New Brunswick. So here we have beautiful New Brunswick and you can ignore all of this, um, uh, all of these words and symbols. The takeaway I'd like you to gain from this image is the shape of New Brunswick and all the colors that are in it. So all the colors represent different rock units. So this is a bedrock geology map. So this is the, the, the rock that's solid and fixed to the ground. And all of these rock units represent not only different rock types, but also the age. Um, so the, Silur the Devonian granites, the Devonian granites, uh, that we're looking at are in the sort of southern region in the St. Andrew, St. Stephen's area, right? That's where we're going to find Hampstead. So I'm just going to zoom in in this area here. And so here's a nice map, geology map of southern New Brunswick. So here's St. John, St. John River. And we have St. Andrews and St. Stephen's. And these little pinky blobs, those are, these colorful blobs, these are our granite batholiths. So this Hampstead granite is up here in this unit near Hampstead in New Brunswick. So the granite industry of southwestern New Brunswick began in the late 1830s and peaked between 1870s and the 1950s before subsiding. And the industry was centered around St. George and Hampstead. And these were famous granites that ended up traveling around the world and making up monuments and building stones um, nationally and internationally. So the granites of um, Southwestern New Brunswick, again, yielded top quality monumental and building stone um, variety of, of granites in reds and pinks and grays and blacks. And it was actually Alfred or Abraham Gesner that discovered the Hampstead Quarry. So he visited this area and uh, noted that the, the quality of the granite was quite good. And here's a quote from uh, his, his publication. So the Hampstead granite is fine grained, compact, and will admit of the most delicate sculpture without crumbling before, it, before the chisel. It is surprising that these fine quarries should have been, or that these fine quarries should have been so long overlooked. So it was thanks to Abraham Gesner that uh, started up the, the Hampstead Quarry at Spood Island. 
Now I wanna give a shout out to Abraham Gesner. Um, Abraham Gesner served as the provincial geologist of New Brunswick from 1838 until or 1842 and was um, the first provincial geologist in Canada. And he is credited with co-inventing kerosene. So this was kerosene was a sort of a liquid uh, petroleum that um, was used to burn lamps and, and lights. So we actually started the petroleum industry here in New Brunswick, which is kind of neat. So he discovered a, a, a solid version of petroleum called Albertite. And the interesting story, and actually it's in Gwen Martin's book, Gesner's Dream, is a whole legal fight. So he developed technology to actually liquefy Albertite and then again, use it for lamps and lighting. Before that, they were using whale blubber. So one of Abraham Gesner's claim to fame is that he saved the whales because then people turned to kerosene for their lights. And we still use kerosene for all sorts of things. So he, um, so he wanted to, to um, credit himself with this invention. And, uh, but the coal industry, which was monstrous at the time, said, nah, -uh -uh, this is a solid, not a liquid, therefore it belongs to the coal industry. And, it's, uh, and there was this whole legal battle. He ended up losing and didn't die. Um, well, he, when he passed, he wasn't, he wasn't a rich man. So it was later that science caught up and confirmed that this was actually a petroleum product and not coal. Um, so that's a really neat story. So that's Gesner, and he, uh, but he was one that uh, really marketed or got the, the granite industry around the Hampstead and, uh, area going, so Hampstead granite. So this is uh, what the quarry would have looked like, lots of sto stone masons working away and chiseling, and they used all sorts of tools to break up the stones. Um, this picture here is actually in St. John at a depot that relied on bringing in in the, the Hamstead, Hamstead granite. And I like this picture. These are all credited to Gwen's research um, because it has these feather stone notches, which if you go to Science East, you can actually see where they were hammering and, and actually separating the blocks. So after they were separated, you can imagine how heavy these were. They were strapped onto horse and carriage and taken to the river and then put onto boats and then were carried up or down river to its final destination. So the, the Hampstead quarry is actually still around, though it's uh, not very active. It's, um, it's been reduced to maybe one excavation operating in intermediate, intermediate intermittent term or uh, um, intermittently. And um, and it is this, it's described as a, a, a beautiful light gray to pink, medium grain, echogranular, hornblende biotite granodiorite, which just means it has a little bit less quartz in it than a, than a, a true granite. Um, all right, and it represents, and this is the this is the a real neat takeaway is that it represents a really dramatic, tectonically dramatic time in our geologic history. So if you remember, how do you make granite? Well, you have to melt the rock. So this granite would have been made in a big magma chamber underneath a volcano where the milk was all accumulating. And so time has passed. The volcanoes have been eroded away, the land is uplifted, and now we get to see granite on the surface. So this is a subsurface process. It took a long time for it to solidify and then uplift for us to hold it in our hand. So if you remember the where we were tectonically during the Devonian, we have a subduction zone, we have nasty volcanoes erupting all over the place, and we have both representatives of land and sea. So what was life like during the Devonian period? If I had a time machine and went back to this point, what would I see? Well, we have to talk about the oceans. So in the Devonian period, this was the age of the fish. And this is a period where jawed fish began to take over the seas. So during this time, the earliest sharks make their appearance, their appearance. But the true kings of the Devonian were another kind of fish called the placoderms. And these had the really hard shell, exterior shell around their bodies. 
The largest of these armored jawed fish um, fill the niches and was, uh, and we associate, they fill the, niche, the niches. Sorry, I'm gonna just take a drink of water. Dramatic pause. So the, uh, these placoderms grew to great sizes and they filled niches that we associate with sharks and whales today. And uh, they included filter feeders and then monstrous jaws um, that could probably eat us in one gulp called the Dunkleosteus. Now they also, we see in the fossil record, the first lobed fish that eventually make its way onto land. And, uh, and then we see the first amphibians. And plants by this time are well established on land, but we only start now, just now, getting the first forests and the first flying insects. So if we go to the, what the life is like on land, and I love these drawings, I capture these from artists that use the, the, the fossil record and they recreate what uh, life would have been like. But we have now, um, full length or tall trees sort of beginning to, to, to grow in, to accumulate. We have a breadth of ferns and, and other small plants. But again, our first flying insects. So that's life in the Devonian. Now, sadly, the Devonian period ends with one of our more mysterious extinction events. We have five mass extinction events in Earth's history. And, uh, and this seemingly, there's a whole bunch of uh, evidence for different ideas of what caused the extinction event at the end of the Devonian. So what we do know is that there was a dramatic drop in oxygen levels in the sea. Um, and that sort of taking its place, this drop, um, it, uh, it dropped over uh, a period of time. So there was at least two phases of the extinction event. So two phases from 375 million years ago to 358 million years ago. But by the end of the Devonian, um, many of the invertebrate fossils and armored placoderms had disappeared from the fossil record. But lucky for us, the tetrapods survived. So there's Science East. And uh, so again, you can go there in 1996. It was purchased and developed into a science center. They still have the jail cells there and they have lots of really fun events. And if you actually go to the back, it's kind of fun. It's a big geology lab in the back of the building. I think they were really pressed for time and they ran, they just wanted to finish the building. And so the front has that beautiful Hampstead granite but the back has all sorts of mismatched rock that they probably found in everybody's backyard and kind of just threw it together. And uh, it does make for a fun geology lab in the back of the building where their, their awesome playground is. So that's Science C. So let's travel now to Officer Square, now known as the Fredericton Region Museum. So Officer's uh, Quarters, Officer's Quarters, um, it was in 1783 when the United Empire Loyalists arrived in New England. So it was the end of the Civil War in the United States and the Loyalists started to, to come into Canada and they migrated through Nova Scotia. At the time, actually Nova Scotia and New Brunswick were one province of Nova Scotia. And they started to migrate up through Nova Scotia and up, um, through, up the St. John River, established St. John, Gagetown, Fredericton. And by 1786, it was separated out into two provinces, Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. Now the, the British army, flashback there, and here's a nice, uh, here's a map of uh, New Brunswick. This is a map maritime from 1786. So the British army officers, um, they lived in stone and wooden buildings from, um, from when they arrived, they needed somewhere to stay. So they had officers' barracks and they had their officers' quarters. So it, it was uh, first completed in 1786. It was a wooden structure and that burnt down. A fire consumed the building in 18, 1815. Then they rebuilt um, and this time they rebuilt and they put in some firewalls and stuff and that seemed to work. Um, because when the second fire came in, it didn't destroy everything. It just kind of destroyed the one side near the river. 
So third time's a charm. So the third time they built, um, they, they built officer's quarter, they used stone. And, uh, and the stone has lasted to, uh, to what we see today. So since it's, it's, um, it was built, it's, um, let's look at my notes here. So it was completed in 1869. And then um, between 1883 and 1914, sorry, my notes are, well, in 1869, Canada became, uh, was officially a country. And so the, the Royal Canadian Regiment occupied the, the officer's quarters. Um, and then in eventually, um, after seven years after World War One, after World War One, the New Brunswick Liquor Commission and other government agencies took over the building and used the stone building until the 1960s when York Sunbury Museum moved in. Now this building was designed by John Elliott Wilfred. I wanted to, again, I mentioned his name when I was talking about Science East and I wanted to uh, highlight uh, a little bit about him. He was uh, a royal engineer. So John Elliott uh, Wilfred, he's an artist, a topographical draftsman and an architect. Uh, and he was born in London, England, and then he, but he eventually moved to Fredericton and died here in 1866. So he spent a lot of his uh, years in England studying drawing and probably as an apprentice in the drawing room of the Board of Ordnance in the Tower of London. And one thing about the Royal um, Engineers, uh, so I just wanted to mention that in England, the military, um, to become a royal engineer, you are trained uh, in civil engineering and architecture. And this was before uh, career architects came into Canada. They actually hired the, um, the royal engineers from the, the British military to design many of the government uh, and forts in Canada. So he actually was the designer for many of our buildings here in in Fredericton, and he was also an artist. So I wanted to, his, a lot of his art is displayed in the Nova Scotia Museum, at the National Gallery in Ottawa. So this is a picture or a painting that he made uh, in 1817, and this is a painting of Fredericton. And he painted all sorts of things, but this is the one that overseeing Fredericton from the hill. And this is in 1820, and he's looking uh, towards the north side of Fredericton. Now, this picture here is of the old Governor General building, the old, the first governor government house in Fredericton. And um, he, this burnt down in 1825. And he actually designed the new Governor General's building, government house, uh, was built in 1828. This is not his painting, but he was the designer. And he actually liked a very particular design. And you'll see that design represented in a lot of his, his work. So he liked this Palladian style um, and the Palladian style, Palladianism is an approach to architecture that's strongly influenced by uh, 16th century uh, Venetian architect, Andrea Palladio or Palladio. So excuse my Italian. And uh, so that style actually became popular in England in the 1800s. And so he actually became really interested in this particular style. So it's famous for its stately symmetry and its L's classical elements, its grand appearance. You got the pillars, you got the arched windows and doorways. And symmetry is a really big, important part of the Palladian design. So these are examples of the Palladian design. So this is a, a, a drawing from an architectural class learning about Palladianism. Um, this is a bridge in England. And of course, the same style he used in the Governor General's house. He also was uh, in, um, uh, he also designed, I can't think of, think of it right now, but then officer, officer's uh, quarters. 
So the stone, so this is really early on in the 1800s, and there really wasn't a, an active quarry um, at, the, at the time that they needed the stone. And so they were looking for somewhere local in these early buildings. And so one of the most local quarries at the time was called Rainsford Quarry, and um, they, they mined Rainsford sandstone. So I have this is a Google image. I turned it on upside down. So the Rainsford Quarry is located near Golf Club Road. So this is west of the central downtown area and is now a golf Fredericton Golf Club. Um, and so you can, you can see the, the 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 holes and the runs uh, of the golf club and the. Remnants of the quarry you can find actually if you go, this is a hole number eight and in the course and the remnants of the quarry is, is still there. Now this, these pictures are actually not from the quarry, um, but uh, I thought to use them because they probably represent what they would have looked like at the time. So big blocks of buff colored sandstone. It was not very good quality sandstone, kind of a pebbly sandstone. Um, but they would have been cut and polished and then moved to the downtown Fredericton area. And this stone was used for a lot of the early buildings, including the Christ Church Cathedral, the Governor General's house, officers' uh, quarters, and um, the provincial building, which we'll see in a moment. And this land, this property was owned by the Rainsford family. And they were a military family that had a very military dad. And these were the two, his two boys, uh, Charles and Lawrence Bradshaw Rainsford. So they were the ones that um, offered their property and they, and they converted it into a quarry to, to mine the, the sandstone. So as I mentioned before, when, we, when we're thinking about the origin of these rocks, we really want to think about that paleo environment. How is it formed? And we're dealing with sandstone, and we've dated the sandstone to be carboniferous in age, about 330 million years old. So where do we find sand? So we have a lot of evidence that this sand uh, was placed in a river system, a really uh, large river system. And so let's look at where we were. Uh, during the Carboniferous period, looking at our paleogeography. So again, map of the world. So this is now about 300 million years ago. And the Laurentia and Gondwana are coming together. And all of these mass continents are coming together. And they're starting to build up that supercontinent called Pangaea. By the time we get to about 250 million years, we've kind of assembled this big continent. So we're kind of slowly building up this big massive continent. So as Gondwana is sort of slamming into these terrains or slamming into Laurentia, we're actually forming the Appalachian mountain chain. That's right here. So Fredericton would have been, right? The, we're the belly button of Pangaea. And at that time, all of that weathering and erosion all that broke down of the, the, all the sediment making up and all the rock making up the mountain chains are starting to erode and moving down slope into this big basin here. This is called the Maritimes Basin. So if you can imagine all of these braided rivers and river systems and they're just moving sediment and they're dumping it along uh, the river system into this, into this region here called the Maritime Basin. Now, this is an area that is near the equator, so it's going to be really warm. And so if you want to think of a modern day equivalent of the environment, we're thinking of like Louisiana, where the Mississippi River system is coming through and it's really warm and swampy. So if we go back to our bedrock geology map, where are we? So the maritime basin was being infilled with all of this sandy um, sediment and outflowing towards the north, the northeast. And we can see that in the rock record. So thus all of this sort of light brown colored material, this is the carboniferous, all the carboniferous rock. And this is where we find the sandstones that we use for the building stones. Carboniferous building stones. So this again is, the, is called the Carboniferous Basin that make up uh, a big chunk of, of New Brunswick and then out into uh, towards PEI as well. 
So if we zoom in, I'm just gonna zoom in. So here's St. John River and Fredericton is around here somewhere. Yeah, there's Fredericton right here, which where the blue is meeting that cream colored. And so Rainsford Quarry is located right here. This is where Golf Club Road is, Garden Creek Elementary School is in this area. And uh, so that's where the quarry is located in the Carboniferous Basin. So what was life like during the Carboniferous? So again, we're in near the equator, we're thinking warm and swampy. This is 300, 330 million years ago, it's before the dinosaurs. So this is an area, an age called the Carboniferous period. And we're gonna be looking at towards the Pennsylvanian. And so this was a really interesting time. So during this time, we had a high oxygen level. So we had, um, higher than normal auction that we have today. It was warm, it was lush, it was swampy. And this is where the arthropods, the insects really thrived. So we had these giant insects, insects like the Meganeura. So this is a dragonfly that was the size of an eagle. And we also had insects like the Arthropora, which is a millipede that's the size of a small car really, really big. And it's really neat. We have lots of fossil evidence for these, these arthropods, these animals. And uh, for the arthropora though, lots of tracks we found in the fossil record. We also found some remnants of its uh, shell fragments. Never found the head. Never found the head. Why? Why would we never find the head? It's really interesting. So every time you see an artist's representation of an arthropora, they all have a different head because someone's just making it up. We've never found the head. So there's also, I don't know, why do you think it never, we never found the head? I'm thinking that's the part that whatever predator ate. <laughs> we started with the head and then they got full up and then they ran away, but who knows? So if you ever find the head of an arthropora, you'd be very, very famous. We also had uh, giant amphibians at the time and the very first reptiles. So most of our electricity actually was produced during this age. So all of this plant material, all of this swampy material uh, were buried, were decomposed, and over time became coal. So we actually nicknamed the Carboniferous Age the Coal Age. So coal is made from the remnants of organisms, and especially plants, that have been exposed to heat and pressure for millions of years. The abundance of life in these deep swamps and dense rainforests created ideal conditions for the coal formation. And because of this big land mass and this, um, and under these conditions, we actually have coal, Carboniferous coal, in many places around the world. So the Carboniferous period is divided into two subperiods: the wet and the warm. So the Mississippian um, was the wet and the warm period, and then the drier Pennsylvanian. And so this is a lush environment. It was high in atmospheric oxygen and the age of these enormous insects. So if you can imagine being in an environment with these insects and cockroaches about the, about the length of like you know, seven centimeters in size, something like that, they're just giant. Really neat to think about. Um, we also have the first and earliest reptiles in the fossil record during this time. Um, and this is where we, they uh, evolved the amniotic egg, or the first amniotes. They had a solid egg with a solid shell that can be laid um, away from the water. So amphibians have to lay their eggs in the water. Reptiles can actually go further inland. So they gave them a competitive edge. So how did it end by the end? So we had actually, should give you some more pictures here. Um, we had these very dense lush forests and the trees that we had during the Carboniferous are not the same trees that we see today. It's, um, we have these lepidendrals, um, calamites trees. Um, this is a really great documentary called Walking with Monsters. And you get these, and if, if you really wanna get a sense of what the Carboniferous was like, or the Paleozoic was like, uh, this is, this is a really great documentary series, really animates everything. Kind of like walking with dinosaurs, but before the dinosaurs. So we have the Calamites trees, which were these segmented fern-like trees that grew up to be really, really tall, as tall as the great white pines, but really shallow roots. And so they would fall down a lot. Uh, Siglarias and the Lepidendrons. We have lots of fossil evidence. These are called scale trees. So you can see the pattern, the scaly pattern of their, of their bark, of their trunk. 
So there's places you can go to see this. Uh, you can go to actually Nova Scotia, the Jog and Fossil Cliffs is a UNESCO geoheritage site. Uh, they will take you down to the cliffs. You can actually find fossils. Uh, you can't keep them, but uh, they let you come to their discovery center, which is right here. And they'll identify it for you and they'll, they'll tag it and they'll put your name attached to it, which is really, which is really neat. But we also have fossil forests, petrified forests here in New Brunswick. So one of them is, is located near Norton, where they found 70 plus fossilized uh, trees. And uh, so here's some fossil evidence that's uh, near Sussex. There are the barks and their branches and the leaves, all sorts of evidence. All right, I'm just gonna highlight two more areas and, uh, and, um, and, and then uh, I think that'll be the end of our tour. I do want to mention the Provincial East uh, Building, or otherwise known as the East Block. This is the earliest, the youngest, or the, um, the first um, building that was built in downtown Fredericton. So this was built um, da -da -da, for the Provincial um, uh, there you go. So it was a, um, da, 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 sorry, lost my place here. So it was erected in 1816 uh, for the provincial secretary. And it seems that this building was built with every stone it could find. So it's all kind of these mismatched stones kind of loosely cemented together. Lots of maintenance with the, that goes with this, mil this building. So the lower part of the building, again, was built in 1816 and uh, with a very mismatched, roughly put together building stone. It's probably from the Rainsford quarry, but they do find stones in there from other quarries that are nearby. Um, one is up by the Lincoln area and one is by the Wilsey Road area. So the same place, but uh, now later on, 50 years later, they needed a second story. And by that time they had located uh, sandstones of better quality. So they actually acquired sandstone from Mary's Point um, and other locations around the Miramichi area. So the second story actually has a much better quality, finer grain sand. Um, and the finishings around these building stones is actually quite lovely. So the buildings, the, the stone masons would select different finishes for different parts of the building. So this is called batted finish here. We have nice uh, parallel lines and the st building stones themselves um, have something called, some of them have ashlar finish. So this is a diagram that was put together by Gwen Martin showing the different finishes that we can see as we're walking around downtown Fredericton. So this is the batted finish, very common for uh, window trim, including Officer Square, you'll see that there, and lots of uh, examples of ashlar finish uh, in, different, uh, in different buildings. So right next door, so an example would be the legislative building. So right next door is the legislative building. So this was constructed, well, the first legislative building was constructed in 1803. And um, this was the construction of the provincial hall. It was made of wood and it was widely disliked due to its poor appearance. And, um, and the governments started to think about replacing it. So they put out actually by 1880, they put out a bid for a tender to think about replacing the building. And then there was this fire that burnt it all down. Um, it was unexpected. And interestingly enough, they had removed all of the important items from the building, like the paintings and anything valuable before the fire happened. So it was very suspicious. But it did lead into uh, building a new building that we now know as the legislative building. So the design, um, the architecture contracted, uh, awarded this, this job was J.C. Dumaresque. And he was um, a very popular um, builder that was responsible for many of the buildings in the Maritimes. Uh, so Dumaras moved to St. John in the hopes of finding work, uh, designing buildings to replace those that were destroyed in um, the, the, the Great Fire of St. John in 1877. So over 250 buildings 
in the Maritimes are known to be the work of uh, Dumarask. And uh, so either through him or through partnerships uh, with, other, with other architects. So his work, he lasted, uh, extended his career extended for 36 years. So they started to, um, they built the legislative building. They started um, building the building, to do, began, began in 1880. And at the height of its construction, they had over a hundred people, including 65 stone cutters who shaped the stones and sized them up. And now there were some delays in the construction, of course. Um, so the building was eventually opened in 1882. And, uh, and what's another interesting fun fact about the legislative building, this whole entire structure had a total bill of $85,000, which is really interesting to think about, $85,000. So with inflation and time, that would be equivalent to about two and a half million dollars today. Still a really good deal for the, the size of, and the enormity and the grandness of this building. So the building, is made from that Hampstead granite. Now this is the, the legislative building and there's the provincial building, East Block right next door. So the East building doesn't have Hampstead granite as a foundation, but the legislative building does. Can you think of why? So I'm hoping you're thinking about that Hampstead quarry and Spoon Island didn't even exist back in 1816 when the provincial building was built, but it did exist and granite makes a much better foundation than sandstone. So they have a beautiful solid sandstone and then they acquired a really high quality sandstone to make up the rest of the building um, called from the Boudreaux Quarry, uh, which is near Dorchester, near the Fundy Coast, uh, just south of Mere Machine. So again, the sandstones, this is the interior, it's lovely. They do public tours. So if you ever get a chance to walk into the legislative building for a tour, you should, it's actually really, really lovely. It houses uh, the MLAs and the premier and the Lieutenant Governor, they work there. Um, they have lots of ornamental decorative materials. It has a very Asian feel to it when you walk in with all the patterns and the colors. Um, lots of really nice, art, nice artistry in the legislative building. So Boudreaux Quarry Sandstone, again, look, there's Miramichi, or sorry, Moncton, Miramichi? Moncton's right there. And so if you go down towards the Bay of Fundy, Boudreaux Quarry is located right here. And it's uh, it's still around, um, it's sort of left as is right now, but you can see the blocks of sandstones that they started to work on and polished up, but then they just left it behind. So Boudreaux Quarry, be right around there in our bedrock geology map. So I think I will end it there. I think it went over my time. I thank you for your patience, but uh, we did the Fredericton Region Museum or officer's quarter. We dabbled into a look at Science East. We jumped into look a little bit of a look to the, in the, uh, to the provincial building and the legislative building. And if you stop by this summer to do a talk, we'll definitely hit the federal building and other buildings around the downtown area with our own unique stories to tell. So thank you very much for your attention today. Um, I hope I give you some motivation to go and visit these buildings and have a look at the stones and get a little mic uh, magnifying glass or a hand lens and really take a look at sandstones and granite. What is a forensic geologist? Ooh, that is such a good question. So a forensic geologist use the principles of geology to solve crimes. So I'll give you some examples. So if you have um, a mysterious mystery body in, you think is buried underneath a house somewhere or in a yard or under cement, we have geophysical tools that we can use to go into that house and look, use um, changes in gravity or changes in moisture or changes in um, uh, different uh, like radioactivity and start to map out what's in the subsurface. And so that way uh, maybe we can discover, and we have, um, or forensic geologists have discovered um, anything from a, a, a buried body to, there was one they were looking for um, grave sites for, um, there was a missing, someone's loved uh, police dog and they found the police dog using forensic geology. 
Now, what's really interesting, they actually use the same techniques to find uh, the grave sites for uh, the children in the old residential schools. They used actually forensic geology to, to discover some of those grave sites, same type of techniques. So that's one example. Another example would be geochemistry. So if you have uh, a crime scene or you have an, um, something that happened, it might change the chemistry of the surface um, material like soil. So you would go in and take some soil samples and you can do some chemistry on that and look at the remnants of whatever you're looking for and, uh, and try to solve the crime that way. Anything from you know, shoe marks to um, leftover blood or I don't, anything. So you can actually do some, some chemistry on soil and, uh, and, and learn about um, a, a possible crime in that area. So those are two examples that I, uh, that uh, in forensic geology um, is, um, is becoming, well, it has been very popular. And even if you don't want to become a forensic geologist, you can always do it as a, as a, a lot of people are called in to do it as a side job. So if somebody needs somebody, they'll give them a call and then we'll come in and actually survey an area and then go back to their day work. So really interesting field. It sounds like one of those vast fields too. Like there's a lot of different parts. To different. There's another example that happened out, out west uh, looking for arsenic in water. So oh. again, sort of a geochemistry application, but mapping out where arsenic, um, where it is and how it was sourced and where it traveled and all forensic geology. So on to the next question. Um, it's a question pertaining to that image of Henry Moore that you had up. Uh, I think the one where he's kind of laid back and waiting to go into his cell. Um, yeah. where, where did that come from? It came from this amazing site that I found. I have the, I can put the, um, the site in the chat called Community Stories. It had a lot of information of Science East. I'll put it in the chat. And then you oh, can. Yes, that, that was okay? probably one of their virtual exhibit projects that they did. Yes. Oh, That's it cool. was great. I sat there and I read over it. It was like, it took me a day. I was like, so. <laughs> I was so captured no. by the. Oh, let me see if I can do this. Wait. Community Memories Project. I think the Canadian Heritage Association funds those. Yeah, great project. All right, Digital so Museum Canada. Digital Museum of Canada Community Stories. Digital Museum of Canada. Yes, that's it. Oh, hurrah yeah. to everybody who put those those types of uh, sites together. Um, they're fantastic and yeah. so yeah. important to capture all like all of that information. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, I agree. Making it accessible. Where can a person get a paper copy of the bedrock geology map? Oh, that is such a good question. Okay, because I have some exciting news. So we actually, you can uh, source them online. The, the government of New Brunswick website, you can get full provincial maps. You can get maps down to one to 20,000 scale. You can get surface maps. You can get bedrock geology maps, all sorts of things from the, for free, digitally from the government of New Brunswick site. But the Atlantic Geoscience Society just published a new geology roadmap. So this is um, a whole map of New Brunswick and PEI. It's a geology map, but not only does it have all of the geological information, it also has lots of information of where to stop to see really fun geology. Um, they have literally just published it. And I am going to make sure I have a good collection Back at the Quartermain Museum, I know Tone is going to have a good collection with him. Uh, he was part of that journey, I'm sure, at some point. And uh, and I we're we're trying to the publication for this new road geologist roadmap geology map. Uh, we were aiming for, for to be published before the 2022 GACMAC conference, which is a national geology conference that they're hosting in Halifax, and and they made their target. So I just heard this week. That is published. So contact me, and I will make sure you get one. Because <laughs> yeah, it's uh, they're yes, really. Good. You can be contacted through the museum. 
And I'm, you can contact, or you can even go to the Atlantic Geoscience Society website. Uh, I know that they will have them as well, and they'll be plugging that map, plus they just came out with a new Nova Scotia one as well. Does the pink to gray granite influence the color of sand, such as the reddish sand in P, of PEI? So, and this is the really cool thing. So sandstone or sand, comes from broken down rock. So we can actually look at the sand grains and connect that to the original rock. So if the original rock was granite, your sandstone is gonna have bits of minerals that were sourced from the granite. So granite is made of a really robust mineral called quartz. So that usually survives weathering and erosion and makes up the sandstone sand grains. Feldspar, and you can have pink feldspar. And so if you have a lot of that pink feldspar that make up the sand grains, your rock will be pink. Um, so they're lithic fragments, just rock fragments that break up, that sometimes breaks up down to the sand sized grains and those can make up sandstones. So you can have gray sandstones, you can have red sandstones, you can have the, the white sandstones, just depending on the type of mineral that make up or rock that makes up the sand grains. Now there's another component in the sandstone and that's the cement. I mean, you can take loose sand and squeeze it all you want. It's not going to hold its shape. As soon as you let go, it'll, it'll fall apart. You need a glue to hold the sand together. And that nature's glue is called cement. And cement can be, um, it's usually precipitated minerals from groundwater that's percolating through the sand grains and it can precipitate out a carbonate. So like the, the limestone, the carbonate material, which is soft and makes a really good cement. Silica, so like a quartz type, uh, harder cement that can make up um, the cement that holds the sand grains together. But hematite, so hematite is oxidized iron, which is red. So hematite, when it's oxidized and gives that red color, that can also make a really good cement and makes a red sandstone. So a lot of the sandstones that we have in PEI are red because it actually has a lot of that, that iron in it, which makes for great growing of potatoes. <laughs> so, so that's a really good connection there. So lots of information you can get from sandstone. You can, you can connect it to its original source. And then if you consider the, the cement as well, changes up the color of the sands. It's a really good question. Is Utopia granite, St. George red, the same red rock as found on PEI? Yeah, I think most of the sandstones in the Carboniferous Basins are dominated by quartz. And uh, quartz makes up, uh, is a part of most of those igneous rocks that we find both in the Caledonia Highlands and the Miramichi Highlands. So, um, and because of the weathering and the transport, uh, all that is often left is quartz or mostly is quartz, but you can, you can source these rocks and uh, sedimentologists are really good with this. They, they can actually trace uh, small amounts of uh, chemistry or minerals back to the original rock types. So the short answer is no. Um, <laughs> um, and uh, yes, it can be done. And you can, that, that's what people do that, uh, that trace uh, origin of, uh, of all sorts of minerals. And they, they trace these things back up upriver, so to say, yeah. Now we have a question about Gesner. Why have we always heard that Gesner was the sole inventor of kerosene? Uh, you referred to him as a co-inventor of kerosene. And he is also the founder of New Brunswick Museum. So if he's the co-inventor, we always hear of him as being the sole inventor. Do you know who the other co-inventor was? Oh, I, I did I say co-inventor? I'm sorry. Yeah. He was no, I, I don't think he was he had a part. No, I think it was just him. I'm maybe uh if I said that I'm so sorry, I misspoke. <laughs> or maybe oh, oh, I, that's I maybe all right. I that's all right. Don't don't that's he fine. Was, yeah. So he developed the technology that was able to convert Albertite into kerosene. Um and he actually did have a, a, a really nice fossil. Um, and rock collection that um, he presented in his own museum. Mm -hmm. And the, the New Brunswick Museum was actually founded after him. Uh, he was part of this, something called the Stonehammer Group. And so they, well, and though they, they actually decided, okay, in the early 1900s, the 
28, 29, that they should really start housing the collections in a, in a provincial in a provincial museum. And, uh, and so the original museum was actually at UMB in Fredericton in the old arts center or the, the, uh, the, the King's College at that time. And so they actually had a botany uh, 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 museum that, that uh, displayed the botany collections and the geology collections. And, uh, and then in the 1920s, they decided, okay, we're gonna build this provincial uh, museum in St. John. And so that's when then Gesner's collections, which he actually sold because he didn't, he couldn't afford to live. So he actually sold his collections in order to get money. And um, and then they went down and they, you can see them now in the New Brunswick Museum. So. <laughs> Another question. Wasn't there a fossil forest destroyed by a road project here in New Brunswick a few years ago? Are there better protections against this in place now? So um, I don't know, I, I can't think of a, a road project that destroyed a, a petrified forest. I know that uh, there was a lot of work done by Randy Miller, who is the curator or a past curator of the New Brunswick Museum. And he was instrumental in building what's called the Heritage Act. Again, going back to geoconservation uh, and, and really thinking about uh, geodiversity and, and geoconservation. So he worked with the provincial government to come up with the Geo Heritage Act. And that does recognize very geological significant areas and works to preserve them. So there's very strict guidelines if anybody wants to go in and collect or bang on rocks or, or anything. So uh, there, you know, I, I was part of a geo heritage club in um, in Ottawa Gatineau area. So it was a bunch of us. This is way back in the day where geo heritage was becoming a thing. And so that was our mission is to create public awareness of geologically significant sites and then work with construction companies with governments to try to have them recognize these as geologically significant and then work to preserve them. So there was one story about a road construction going right through the Nepean sandstones that had these really um, significant um, algal mats, like really early on during the Ordovician. So this is really early in, in, uh, in the Paleozoic era. And, uh, and they wanted to build this road. And so the, with the help of the Geo Heritage Club, we preserved a lot of these big slabs of Nepean sandstones. And there was a housing unit that actually decided to not build, not destroy these really large stromatolites, these really early living things in, in Earth's, Earth's history and actually just made it into a nice little um, park area that they built the houses around them. So another really good news story of how geo conservations can work. I would be curious to know if that's, I, I'll look into that to see if there was a road, because uh, those petrified forests are, are um, should be protected for sure. Uh, there's not that many of them and they are yeah. extremely important to, to understand, like there's still so much research to be done in understanding our history of that time. So Charles Ferris then extends a thank you. Um, and he also says, referring to the equality of sandstone, what is the relationship between quality and the impact of the environment on the stone exterior of a sandstone building, e.g. the cathedral? That's a, another great question. So the quality of sandstone has to do with the uniformity of the sand grains itself. So um, how well sorted the sandstone is. So um, if you remember, I related the formation of sand to energy. So the, the, the higher the energy of an area, then you get all sorts of you know, big pebbles down to sand size, down to clay size material, all kind of jumbled up in a rock. And so when you have that assortment, um, they would classify that as a poorly uh, poor quality sand or poor quality stone. It falls apart. Really, and it doesn't look too good having all the bumps in it and doesn't clean off to a straight edge and doesn't pair up to a neighboring uh, stone very well. So when you have a, a much finer grained, um, much better well sorted sandstone where all the grains are small and they're all the same size, 
then you can cut them smooth, you can polish them off smooth, and then you can, and then they can, um, you can layer them quite nicely. And so that would be one way of, of um, assessing the quality of the sandstone. Now, sandstone as um, a robust stone, and um, in that how it sustains weathering and um, exposure to the elements. So in that sense, it's not a very good stone. So sand is porous. We kind of went through that, that analogy of Lego where there's water can get through. So water can actually percolate through sandstone. And so as soon as you get water exposed to the surface opposed to, or, or, or actually entering into the, the stone itself, then the, the reactions start. So you can get chemical reactions so any material in the sandstone can start to dissolve. You can have oxidation. So iron, any iron that's in the sandstone will oxidize. Uh, pulling out iron from minerals is like pulling out bricks from a, from a wall, it destabilizes the material. Uh, you can get um, carbonation hydrolysis. These are all chemical reactions that will start to decompose the minerals that's in the rock. And so, You'll start to see uh, discoloration on the surface. So if you see red, that's oxidization from iron. If you see yellow, that's sulfur and black is manganese. So if you actually go outside and look at the wall of officer's quarters, the wall that's covered and, and protected actually has some really decent um, textures and, and, and it looks quite good. But if you go around to the side where it's exposed to the elements, you get all of the discoloration from chemical weathering. And so eventually that does break down. And if you go to the, the, the buildings with this, that are made up of sand, you'll see that discoloration and that is an indication of chemical weathering. It's breaking up the stone. You'll see um, some of that stone, the edges will start falling apart because as soon as you start breaking it up, or destabilizing the stone using chemical weathering, it opens up more surface area and more exposure to the physical weathering. So more of that frost wedging and the and, and movement from wind, water, and um, and rain, or to move actually those materials away. And uh, if you go down to the base of the, some of these buildings, they're really difficult to maintain because, of course, we have winters. We got the shoveling, we've got all of the salts that are going over and uh, trying to get rid of the ice. And so, so in that sense, the, the sandstones are not as robust as that, say, granite. Like as Tone was saying, granite is made up of really robust minerals like quartz and felspars. It has that interlocking te texture that locks away that moisture can't get into. So they call granite the rock of ages for a reason. It really does sustain, it's much more robust when it comes to weathering and erosion over time. So, next question. If I have a correct understanding from the talk that Fredericton was near the equator once, how did it get so far north today? Okay, so this is the really neat thing about Earth is that we have something called plate tectonics. And, uh, and this is unique, it's unique to earth. And it's, um, so if you think of the earth like an egg, uh, we live on the hard part, the shell is really thin, but it's hard and it's brittle and the shell is all cracked up. And each, each uh, fragment, uh, we call that a plate. And so the earth is kind of made up of all these little patchy plates. And when these two fragments come together, we call that a plate boundary. Now, now what's driving movement, um, a lot of it has to do with what we think is the internal heat that was trapped in the earth during its formation, from its formation. So we have that internal heat plus heat generated from radioactive elements and it's keeping things really, really hot. So what happens when you put a hot uh, or, or a pot of porridge on a hot stove, well, eventually you'll start to get movement and the hot material will come up, cool down, and then it'll start to go back down and the hot material will come up and then it'll move across the river and go back down. And so this is actually a, a transferring heat through a process called convection. It's actually moving the material up to cooler areas, cools down, then it comes denser and then drops down. This is what's happening all over the planet on Earth. So inside Earth, 
is driving this heat is driving convection and that heat the, that plasticky asthenosphere is moving it's actually a solid but it's moving not very fast these are slow processes so it's moving about maybe 30 centimeters a year um, but it's moving and it's carrying the lithosphere with it like a, like a little raft <laughs> so over long periods of time these plates start to 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 move and part of the lithosphere or continents like Laurentia and now it's North America. And so that is actually what's moving everything around over time. And we have so much evidence for this now. It's one of those, those theory of plate tectonics has now become a paradigm because it explains so much. And we have so much evidence that it's happening. And there's so many ways that we can determine where the continents are now, where they were in the past and where they're going to end up in the future, which is really kind of uh, neat. And so we can we'll actually be back on the equator. <laughs> so, yes, eventually we'll probably be back down to the equator. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so that's uh, so there's all sorts of science and techniques that we use to position the plates. So we know why, you know, why we think we know where all the plates were at different points in time. So speaking of sandstone. Weren't there high what weren't there high quality grindstone quarries in New Brunswick as well? The so the ones that I was mentioning, the St. Mary's quarry, and although there's a there's several quarries actually by uh, that Miramichi Moncton area that actually generate very high quality sandstone that are still that are still around today. And these quarries, um, they generate uh, products for not only the region around here, but also into other provinces and into the United States as well. So it is a it is a a a, a, a well known, well recognized uh, industry for quality for quality stone. Now, the, well, I didn't get to talk about the department building that housed um, the Saint George granite, and that's a famous granite. And uh, we can see that that's the pink granite that you see making up pillars and monuments. And, uh, and so if you go down to Kingston, the monuments of, I think it's like John A. McDonald is made out of the pink granite. And Thank you everyone tonight for joining us for yet another excellent program. And I'd like to, again, thank Anne for her presentation, as well as the committee for uh, putting this together. So we have Stephen and Charles and and uh, Peter Momberg and Melinda, of course. And uh, I think Alexandra does our editing. So many great people behind this program. So I would like to extend our thanks to them as well. I want to remind everyone or inform you, if you don't already know, that our next program will be Fashionable Motoring in New Brunswick's Keep Left Crisis with Sean Cox. That is going to take place on May 20th at 7 p.m. and again over Zoom. So I hope to see you there. If you have any further questions, and I know that we do have uh, at least one in the chat that we had, didn't get to today, uh, you can always contact the Fredericton Region Museum by email at all one word, Fredericton Region Museum at gmail.com or call them at 506 455 6041. You can also check out their website, www.fredericktonregionmuseum.com, or their Facebook page for up-to-date information. I frequently check out the Facebook page. It is always up-to-date with the latest information. And um, yeah, again, thank you, Anne. That was fabulous. And thank you, everybody. And good night. Good night.